Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at the total synthesis of cephalosporolite F. This work, the stereoselective total synthesis of the elusive cephalosporolite F, was published in Jock by the group of Sartio Piskil. Cephalosporolite F was first isolated in 1985 by Hansen et al from Cephalosporium aphidicola. It is a member of a large family of cephalosporolides, many of which have been the targets for total syntheses due to the challenge of stereoselectively constructing spiroketal. This is quite difficult, and most syntheses reported in the literature have been achieved as a mixture of diastereomers. Much of the difficulty in stereoselectively synthesizing 5-5-membered spiroketals stems from the fact that they have less anomeric stabilization than systems containing 6-membered rings, and therefore, there is little difference in the energy between both isomers. We have encountered the problem of spiroketal synthesis several times before on this channel, such as in Leonucatal, where the authors used a gold promoted cyclization of an alkyne to form the 6 6 spiroketal system. Similarly, the Baran synthesis of portamines A and B also used a gold promoted reaction of an alkyne, in this case, forming three five membered rings containing the spiroketal motif. We have also covered two different syntheses of spirochancelite A which contains a 5-6 spiroketal system, one of which is present as a lactone. The Yang synthesis used a rather unusual reaction involving the addition of singlet oxygen to a furan, which then undergoes an intramolecular attack of the hydroxyl group, followed by a rearrangement. In the heritage synthesis, they opted for an alkyne-based method similar to the Brimble and Baran syntheses. In this case, they used an oxidative cyclization, where the alkyne is first activated by palladium, which then goes on to form the spiroketal that is then oxidized in situ by copper dichloride and aqueous hydrochloric acid. So let's look at the synthesis and see how these authors tackled this problem. The synthesis started with the reaction of glucose and Meldrum's acid. Glucose is in equilibrium between the closed chain and open chain form. It is this open chain form that is first deprotonated by terp-butylamine, forming an enolate that attacks the transient aldehyde, which is then protonated forming the alcohol. The alpha position of Meldrum's acid is once again deprotonated by terp-butylamine, allowing for an E1-CB elimination to produce an electrophilic enone. This then undergoes conjugate addition from the C5 hydroxyl group, reforming the cyclic glucose, and the enolate is reprotonated. The C2 hydroxyl group then attacks Meldrum's acid in a reaction that is driven forward by the elimination of both acetone and carbon dioxide. This forms an alpha-beta unsaturated lactone that then undergoes conjugate addition, this time from the C4-hydroxyl group. Protonation of the resulting enolate furnished the product with an overall yield of 58%. This reaction is rather remarkable as it generates a very complex but stereo-defined product in a high yield from very cheap and readily available starting materials. While this reactivity has been reported before, yields have typically been moderate and the reported reactions have been carried out over five days. The conditions reported in this paper take advantage of microwave heating and were able to complete the same reaction in just two and a half hours. This compound was then taken forward to a malaprade oxidation. The reaction with periodic acid forms a cyclic five-membered adduct that then undergoes oxidative cleavage to form an aldehyde. This aldehyde then took part in a Wittig reaction. The concerted addition of the phosphorus illid to the aldehyde produces a four-membered oxophosphatane intermediate that then undergoes a cycloreversion to eliminate triphenylphosphine oxide and produce the target enone with a 70% yield with an E to Z ratio of 4 to 1. Taking this compound forward, the hydroxyl group was then phosphorylated. DMAP first attacks diphenylchlorophosphate, forming a more activated electrophile that is then attacked by the hydroxyl group, regenerating the DMAP catalyst. This formed the target in an 85% yield. The ketone, installed with the Wittig reaction, was then reduced using a Cori Bakshi Shibata reaction. A borane adduct, formed from the reaction of the CBS catalyst with DMS borane, first adds to the ketone, where the oxygen coordinates to the boron of the CBS catalyst, and this allows for the hydride transfer from borane to be directed from one phase. The boron adduct, formed by this addition, is then broken by another equivalent of borane. This BH2 adduct is then hydrolyzed by aqueous ammonium chloride to form the target alcohol 
and a 70% yield with the 5 to 1 DR over two steps. This newly formed alcohol then took part in a Mitsunobu reaction. Dyad is first attacked by triphenylphosphine oxide and the resulting anion then deprotonates N-hydroxythalamide. The triphenylphosphonium moiety is then attacked by the secondary hydroxyl group which is deprotonated by the diamide. The activated hydroxyl group can then undergo an SN2 reaction with the oxythalamide, eliminating triphenylphosphine oxide to form the product with the stereochemistry at the secondary carbon now inverted. The alkene present on the side chain was then reduced using hydrogen gas and Perlman's catalyst in an 85% yield. With this complete, they could then carry out the spirocyclization. This was done using photoredox chemistry. An iridium catalyst is first irradiated with UV light to generate an excited iridium-3 species. This is then reduced by a Hansch ester to form an iridium-2 complex. It is this iridium-2 complex that first reacts with a substrate, carrying out a one-electron reduction of the thalamide group. Reaction of this compound with the oxidized Hansch ester eliminates hydroxythalamide to produce a radical residing on the secondary oxygen. A 1,5-hydrogen atom transfer then occurs, forming a radical at the tertiary ether that triggers the heterolysis of the phosphate group. The resulting oxonium intermediate can exist in two different conformations. In the conformation shown at the bottom, a contact ion pair is formed between the phosphate anion and the oxonium. This orientates the side chain towards the bottom face of the ring, and this is disfavored due to the poly repulsion between the hydroxyl group and the lactone. Instead, the conformation with the side chain on the top face of the ring is favoured, and this allows for the hydroxyl group to be stereoselectively captured to form the desired spiroketal and complete the synthesis of cephalosporolite F. Well, that's everything for this video. Join me in the next one, where we will look at prodrug strategies against varicella zoster virus.